what is up and welcome to another episode of Rocket Live. I'm your host, Chris Vaglio, and I am joined today by a friend and colleague, Mr. David Jassy from GMJ Studios. What is up, David? How are you? Thank God. Everything's terrific. How are you, Chris? I am doing well, doing really well. And I, I feel like uh, we've been talking about getting together and doing this interview for for quite some time. So I am happy that we're finally able to to get it going and and, and, and you know, pull it off, man. It's It takes a lot. It takes a lot to make the time to do these things. So I'm happy we can make it happen. And we're going to share those trade secrets that we spoke about, that we agreed that we're going to reveal to That's your right. audience, right? That's right. All the industry trade secrets, everything, all will be revealed. So make sure you listen all the way to the end of the show to get the big secret to uh, creative professionalism. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. Um, so, David, let's let's just dive into it. Um, every superhero has an origin story. What is your origin story? When did you first discover your creative superpowers? Ah, that's a very interesting question. When I was in college, I was an engineering student, and I started taking pictures on the university newspaper. One day, there was this woman, in, uh, and she looked half asleep. And I'm like, why are you so tired? She says, I'm a photo editor. I'm up all night doing photo editing for the university newspaper at Stony Brook, mm -hmm. which was 20,000 issues three times a week. To make a long story short, I started being a photographer, assistant editor, editor, director of photography on the university newspaper. I had a column every week. I did yearbooks and I did college calendars. And the next thing you know, the engineering career was gone and the media and the video career was starting. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. You know what? And I, I did some of that too. I Not so much in high school. Well, I did a little bit in high school. I, I took a creative writing class in high school, and I remember that we did – I can't even remember what it was called, but it was a book like they put out so you – you could write and then you know if it was kind of good enough like you made it into the book and they distributed it to like the whole school and i i can't i think i may have written a a poem or something like that <laughs> but but it actually made it in and i was like i was so blown away <laughs> i'm like oh this this silly little thing made the book but um and then when i got to college i actually started writing like for the the uh the college paper and i was just i was just doing music reviews you know i would just i would review the music stuff i would do a lot of, like a lot of like punk and hardcore and metal stuff and um and that was always fun you know so that was sort of my little foray into uh you know published work as a big <laughs> um so david why don't we take one step back because I, I loved the origin story so that was great but let's talk about what you're up to up to now because i think when people hear dmj studios i think they know exactly what it is you might be doing, but why don't you let everybody know, like, what, you know, what do you do? What is, what is DMJ Studios? What does David Jassy do now? So first, a little bridge from the last story. I worked one day in photography, mm -hmm. and then I got my first job in television at CNN. I, right. hap I happily got on a train at 4.17 a.m. in the morning to work the early shift. And to this day, it was the coolest job in the world. That's awesome. Fast forward more than 25 years. And this week we were out doing a corporate video for a telecom company, had actors, mm -hmm. had an amazing crew, had an amazing producer set up the shoot, bringing on wonderful artists and graphic artists for the post-production. And not only are we doing a set of corporate videos, explainer and company videos for Maxip Telecom on Long Island, we're also redoing their brand. So we've moved beyond video and we've gotten involved in some brands. We've helped out some schools. We've helped out some companies because a lot of people are the real deal. They know what they're doing, but their PR and marketing is not great. So usually a marketing company calls us in or an organization to do a high-end promotional video to raise awareness, to raise funds. But sometimes they don't even have that. So. Right. It's no fun making a great video that nobody sees. So we help them with some marketing. We've built a handful of websites. So we've evolved from strategic video creators to more of an agency and helping the clients get the word out and have results. So it sounds to me like where where um, what started as a uh, 
you know, sort of a traditional video production company um, has evolved into more from what it sounds like a, a, a turnkey solution for your clients, like being able to help them with, yeah, all their different market needs beyond just the actual video production itself. Yeah, absolutely. Over the over the years, as you start to create great content for people and they're usually getting it out there or they're not getting it out there, you learn a lot. You learn the business, you learn the digital marketing, you learn the websites, and there's no reason that we shouldn't be supervising that. About 10 years ago was our first success. Mm -hmm. We helped a special needs school in New Jersey go from a million to two million in fundraising the first year. We did a, a brand makeover and we gave them their tagline, a uniquely special education that they're still using uh, to this day. And it was wonderful. A lot of our work is in the nonprofit space mm -hmm. because we find that nonprofits are some of the best businesses out there when they're run like a business. Right. And we could use our skill sets and all the things we learned in our broadcast television background for good causes. We love to do that. Yeah, I like that a lot. I mean, that's that's super interesting because, you know, I think everybody sort of has their their niche or the thing they fall into or the thing they just enjoy doing, right? So sometimes it's like you start out um, doing one thing and then you sort of get pulled into another direction that you didn't necessarily initially start out wanting to do. And, you know, it doesn't mean that you don't like doing the other stuff, but you definitely start to find the things that um, – you know, you just really enjoy doing the, the the types of projects and working with the kinds of clients that just, you know, really kind of put a smile on your face and, and also, but, you know, fulfill you creatively as well. Well, one of our taglines is making the world a better place one video at a time. Mm -hmm. And we've been very, very fortunate to work with brain injury, suicide, suicide, mm -hmm. you, you name it in the nonprofit space where we help people tell their stories in an emotional way, mm -hmm. in a short and sweet way these days. Back in the day when there were more of these banquets, yeah. pe people pay a thousand bucks a couple to go to a dinner. Mm -hmm. And we were doing seven minute, 10 minute, sometimes even 15 minute short movies. And after all the speeches, everybody, and, and they ate and they drank, they were happy to sit back and watch a movie. It's It still goes, it mm -hmm. still goes. We do a lot of short, promotional videos to get people to events. We do a lot of those videos that go on the top of those fundraising sites. Right. And then during the pandemic, we actually pivoted uh, to one hour virtual shows, which was easy for us because we came from TV. Mm -hmm. And if someone says make good TV for an hour, we've been there. We've done that. We know how to do it. So the TV background is really fantastic. And that goes for corporate also. Because very often corporate America, their videos are terrible and they could use people like us who come from broadcast television. Right. I'm, I'm a little bit of a broadcast <laughs> television snob. Right. I've come to <laughs> appreciate my background and my education that I got in network TV. We cranked out good content right. daily, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes when you work with a corporation or company or organization, there are a lot of cooks and it takes a long time to put out a piece. Yeah. TV, we were cranking out a half hour show every week. We were cranking out three minute pieces every day. It, it was amazing. And if I, I don't want to be rambling, but when it comes to hiring people, I, I look to hire those types of people also who come from broadcast television. You know, you said something pretty interesting, and I, I want to sort of just go back to that really quick. You were talking about the need in, in, of, uh, you know, really producing quality content for, for corporate America, you know, and really kind of bringing that, um, you know, the, the TV production experience or, you know, whether you come from a filmmaking experience or bringing it in. But, you know, that that is interesting. I mean, for, for you, and I'm sure a lot of other, you know, everybody has their own thing. I think creative professionals have their own way of doing things, their own process, their own system, the thing that really helps them. But, you know, for you in particular, how do you balance creative experimentation but still meet the client's needs. Like, how does that work for you? The most important thing is start with the end in mind. Who are we commuting, communicating to? And we're in the storytelling business. And I love being in the storytelling business. And what I mean by that is when you hear somebody speak, no matter how good they are, no matter how dynamic they are, I was even just watching Anthony Robbins today. Mm -hmm. When he brings on the stories, bang, everybody's engaged. 
So your question was like, how do you bring your art form into corporation? Storytelling, emotion, real people. You know, we're like the video police. I, when I see a boring corporate video where somebody's reading a couple of lines, that's the worst. A story that comes from the heart touches the heart. So when we work with people, I get the real people, the emotion, the story at the same time as the messaging. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a long time saying of ours that we're not making video brochures. You know, that's a different type of communication where, you, you know, that's more like a PowerPoint or something like that. So we have to do communication that touches people, that reaches people, that they'll remember with just the right amount of information. Interesting. Yeah, I, I like that. I think that's uh, I think that's a that's a great way to to sort of sum it up and, and really, you know, find that that balance, because I agree storytelling. I think there's nothing more powerful than I mean, we've been telling stories uh, to each other for, you know, as long as we can actually think and speak uh, as a species. So I think that there's there's really when you boil it down at the end of the day, like nothing can just re nothing can really replace just good storytelling. You know, and when you bring it, when you break it down to those basics and you have solid story, then you're just building on top of that. So I, I like that. I think that's a, that's a really great way to look at it. Um, what I want to dive into a little bit more is I think the process, because I've always found this very interesting and, and uh, you know, especially talking to other creatives and entrepreneurs and business owners and everybody has their, their way of doing it. And I just, I always find it very fascinating, but how do you approach brainstorming and generating new ideas? How does that how does that look for you? That's a very good question. I mean, very, very often you're inspired by something you just saw. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a client just called me up out of the blue just now and says, I want a, a dog commercial. I have a, I like I didn't even know the guy opened <laughs> his own business. And he's like, I want a commercial for a doggy thing. So my first question, you know, to the client is, have you seen something that you liked? You know, mm -hmm. whether it's from a competitor or something out there, it doesn't even have to be related to the subject because it's very difficult to people say they don't know what they want. But when they ask for something, in reality, they see something. Mm -hmm. It could be a channel. It could be a movie. It could be a commercial. And it's very important to find out what the person and the client has in their mind. Number one, yeah. whenever, whenever possible. And then the other thing is I find it strange when I see boring stuff because like I'm a human being and I seem to understand what will bore other human beings and what won't bore other human beings. When I see bad TV out there, I just say like, what were they thinking? Would you watch this? I wouldn't watch this. I'd be changing the channel. So I'm very excited when I'm interviewing something, when I'm directing something, that when it's long, when it's boring, when it's not good, yeah. I'm in charge and I stop it or I go in a, a different direction. And then when we're in the edit room, I have 25 years of editing experience. Mm -hmm. You know, less is more. Cut it down, 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 down. When in doubt, leave it out. So, uh, you know, it, it's a process uh, starting. And I, I must say, I bring in some amazing creatives. I, I work with people from advertising agencies mm. who have done creative for Volkswagen and Amex and for beer. And as good as I am from all my years, these ad guys who do copy for us and stuff, they're better. Um, very often you're knocking your brains out when you're communicating features and you're communicating benefits. And then all of a sudden, like with Maxip, with this company we're doing the brand for, Yoni Lazar, who's worked for all the big agencies, whether it's Deutsch or BBDO over the years, you know, when he comes out with like live life to the max, you're like, yeah, that sounds like the real thing. <laughs> you know, we'll go on with benefits and with features and all this kind of stuff. And then he'll hone these things down to a couple of lines and it just has a great ring to it. So the secret to making great communications is having a great team from the creative to the producer who sets up the shoot, which allows the director to work to the cameraman DP to the actors mm -hmm. when everybody could bring something to the table and get along. That's the best. Uh, we were blessed with a wonderful production like that this week. The producer did a great job. He brought along assistants. He brought along prop people. Somebody else took care of the actors. 
when you have a whole team come together, uh, there's nothing like it. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. I mean, working with just like-minded people who are all on the same team, all dedicated to one goal, and, and in this case, you know, producing a, a creative project, it's great. There's no better feeling in the world, you know, than, than having that camaraderie, you know, where you have that shared, you have a shared experience together. And, and it's all to create something, you know, wonderful, something beautiful, something that uh, is going to help change someone's life or, you know, whatever it is. I mean, insert adjective here type of thing. But I do. I, I agree with that. It's, it is a great, great feeling. Um, I think that's a great uh, lead into another question that I have because, you know, I often find you know, in the, in the creative world, right? There's lots of, you're, you're constantly trying to, especially now, is you're, there's so much is going on. So much is changing. You know, there's so many different platforms where, you know, you're creating content for, you know, not just sort of the traditional broadcast uh, places anymore, but, you know, you, and even beyond YouTube, but you've got TikTok and you've got Instagram Reels. And you've got so many other places now where content can live and be cut up into different things. And this is the this is the thing I find challenging because I'm always trying to do it is, you know, really trying to stay on top of like current things that are happening in the industry. Um, how do you do that? How do you constantly find, you know, find new information or stay informed on what's happening and and you know, are, is that something you're looking at every day? Is it something that you're talking to? Like, where are you getting that from and being able to stay on top of like what's happening now? As much as I love working in the business, I'm working on the business and I've been fortunate to hire some rock stars. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to keeping up with everything, you know, like, for example, we're looking for a social media marketing people to work with us. We have a few and we're looking for more. Mm -hmm. And I bring up the analogy, you don't really, when you learn a language, you want immersive. You, you go to the country, you learn the language, not as good as if you went to a class. So I feel the way, that same way about social media and about the new things. There are younger people who are immersed in this technology and they're very good at the art form and we're a little more senior, we're good at the business form. So that's where business meets art. And that means art meets practicality. Mm. So I think it's important to have a, a strong team and to have people who are very good at what they do. And those people is how you is how you keep up. I don't know if that's English. Those people is how you keep up. <laughs> Working with those people yeah. is how you keep up. Right. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, I and I think there's so much you can learn from working with others and, and bringing people on and recognizing where people's strengths are and utilizing that. I mean, that's, you know, one of the things I always learned early on was, you know, one of my mentors told me 20 plus years ago, like always hire people better than you, you know, be around people better than you because it just ultimately makes you better. Um, it's just a natural way of things. You just said something pretty interesting, too, where uh, you were talking about business and creative. And I, I do want to talk about that because I feel like that's something that a lot of – it's something that I talk to a lot. And I think it depends where you are in your career, especially I feel like younger or at least <laughs> when I was coming up in the industry a little bit younger. But I, And I'm wondering, too, where that is now. But that bridge, though, between creative, being creative and the business side because <laughs> they seem like, you know – sort of oxymorons like they shouldn't exist together but they have to especially if you say hey i want to make a living as a creative professional and i'm moving on you know i want to build something i want to build a business and i think that transition seems to be maybe difficult sometimes for some folks to wrap their head around uh did you have something like that did you struggle with that or was that something that sort of uh was intuitive to you like you know, where, where did the, the blend of creative and business come for you? And like, how is that transition? Or like I said, was it was it easy for you? Or was it something you sort of had to work at? Well, I think all of us work on our business and in our business. And we all start off in the beginning being a little bit more dreamy. Then we get a little bit more practical. And now I'm getting back to more dreamy. And I'm looking at some of those projects like feature films that I wanted to do in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it's always a balance, I think, of you know, the job you're doing or the career you're in and the career you wanna be in. So that's like the balance between 
dreams and practicality. But practically speaking, I think, and the way I try and run my business or the way I think about it is integrity comes first. So that's the most important thing. If you are confident that your markups are proper, that your procedures are proper and your fees are proper, um, that helps everyone and everything. Mm -hmm. What I really love about an AICP bid form, for example, is it's all out in the open. Right. There are no secrets here. I, I remember early on when we were talking with a client um, and my uh, the, the producer who was senior to me was talking to the client and the client goes, what's this? He said, this is our markup. This is our profit. We do make profit. This is our insurance. No secrets. So I, I think when we work with clients who understand that and appreciate it, it's a budget, there's a cost, then things go smoothly. When people think like this is magic and it's like a fixed bid and how much is the video? That's like, uh, that's very difficult. So I think your original question was how does creative meet the business, you know, the business side. And I think the creative could really do its thing when they do meet, when you do have people who understand that it's by the day, it's by the hour, it's by the shoot. And there is there's, there is a, a science to this. It's not all art. Yeah, I, I agree. And it was something that I definitely, I mean, I, I went, when I, when I started, you know, I went to school for filmmaking, like, I didn't know anything about business. I didn't even think of starting a business. Like business was the furthest thing from my mind until it actually was like, you know, hey, let's start a business. And even then it was like, I didn't think I even truly understood what that meant. You know, 20, what is it? 24, 25 year old me. I don't even think I even, I don't think I even understood what it means to start a business. You know, I was just like, hey, this is going to be a way for me to, to make music videos and make films and commercials and all that without thinking of the business side of then, you know, and I learned trial by fire. Like, I, you know, I had no idea about business. So everything I learned about business was by doing an experience. And, you know, for me personally, yeah, it was, it was a transition. It was, it was kind of a wake up call, um, for me to, and what you were talking about, like all those things, like I, I learned how to do all those things. I did not know how to do those when I started my, I no idea <laughs> how to do any of that stuff. And I, I learned and trial and error and I got better, you know, every year I got a little bit better at it, but you, you and your partner built a very successful business. Did you find that one of you was more of the creative and the other one was more of the numbers or you feel like you were eventually able to do both kind of mm. sort of just as well? Or I think you even transitioned from the creative <laughs> to the business. Yeah, it's a, that's, a, that's a really great question. So, yeah, when, when I had started my, uh, my, my business, you know, 20 years ago at this point, um, yeah, I'd say for both of us, we we're both very involved in the creative. I think it's just uh, creative inspiration came from different, you know, I guess stylistically we had, while we, we were in sync on like what was our influences and where it came from, I think our output of creative was, was different, but it worked really well. Um, and then later, you know, as we developed, we developed, you know, who was stronger at what within the business, you know. Uh, he was very good with like, you know, the books and the finance and like a lot of the um, – the upfront operational stuff. And I sort of started falling more into the networking and business development and quote unquote sales, whatever that was. And, and that's sort of like so how you're it, saying it evolved. It definitely evolved. I mean, it wasn't something we started off and being like, okay, you're going to do this and you're going to do this. Like it was just like things started happening. So just sort of naturally started gravitating towards, I guess the things that we felt like we could do good, you know, and then as we grew as business, then you really identified it. Like this is a strength, this is a weakness, and and you have to identify those things and and then and use them. Like you have to, otherwise the business isn't gonna grow. Would you do it the same way if you had to do it again, or when you're advising <laughs> people? I would definitely say I don't regret anything. Um, I would definitely say that it probably would have. I don't know. It's so funny because it's like. I love learning how I did learning experience and trial by fire. I would have liked I think if I had had a little bit more background and maybe some things I had, I probably would have been able to accelerate the process a little faster than I did. So maybe that would be great. But other than that, um, you know what I would say is go out and find the mentors in your life uh, quick. 
<laughs> don't you know identify it and and because people want to help they just you but you got to ask like they aren't just gonna cut, fall out of the sky and be like would you like me to mentor you like that doesn't happen like you have to find the mentors they are out there they want to help find them as fast as you can because it will definitely like shorten the learning curve in the sense of trying to figure it out like all on your own because listen everybody you, you know the people i learned from they had walked the path, so it's not like anything was reinvented. It's just that they've been through it, so they are able to share and tell the stories. Here we go with storytelling and share their experience. And from listening to their story and their experience, I was able to learn and then create my own experience and then learn from those things. So I would say that that would be something that I would recommend everybody to do. And I probably wish I'd done it a little sooner, but it was it was good. It happened when it happened, and I'm glad it did. So. <laughs> That that would be that would be my my recommendation. Great question. <laughs> uh, so as we're getting to the end here, there is a couple more things I, I would like to talk about before we wrap it up. One of the things going on, and as we're recording this, because listen, these these we record these videos and and interviews, and they they live on <laughs> in the ether. Uh, so I'm gonna date it in a way of talking about this, but currently. As in this year of 2023, early on in January when we're recording this, the big, big thing going on right now, the big trend in in creative or the world actually is is AI, right? So AI, nothing new. It's 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 been with us. We've been talking about it. It's been in the news. But what makes it fascinating right now is one of the AI programs that is out there now, um, Chat GPT, uh, is sort of taking the world, the internet by storm. And it's created quite the dialogue, which I think is a good dialogue to have. It's good when something comes along and gets everybody like talking and, you know, when you take one side or the other, but it's, it's, to me, it's a healthy dialogue that's going on. I'd love to hear what you think about things, you know, the AI in the sense of a chat GPT and the future of AI, you know, our, our uh, robot overlords. <laughs> Well, so, what are your thoughts on this? So let me tell you a story. Let's Crit hear a story. Tell my, me a story. <laughs> my son showed it to me first. I thought it was interesting. And then you, Chris, sent it over to me. And I started writing with it. And I was amazed because I'm a good writer. I like to write. But it took a lot of the pain out of it. You still need a professional. Just because you know Word, it doesn't make you a writer. Just because yeah. you know Premiere, doesn't make you an editor. It's an advanced tool but it's still a tool. So I was not, <clears throat> excuse me. I was not happy with some of the content, which is normal that my content writers were doing for me, for my blogs and for my website and stuff like that. And you know, it's a process and we normally revise it, but it was kind of taking a while, whatever. And then you showed me the, the program. I jumped in, I wrote a couple of them and I sent it to the writer and she goes, am I out of a job? I said, absolutely not. I want you to use this. Like, so w why should the, the new tools be for just the new people? So that is, when the professionals get a hold of all these advanced tools, we could do our job even better. Uh, there's no replacement for a human story, a human being, a human sensitivity. These are just tools, even when they're very advanced, yeah. based on human knowledge fine it just makes it easier for the people who are really good at it anybody who focuses on like my job is obsolete you know there's a saying that says if you think it's it's gonna work you know if you think it's not gonna work you're right <laughs> right whatever yeah. you think that that's what it is so if you yeah. think it's gonna replace you it's gonna replace you if you think that this is the most amazing tool since chicken soup then this is the most amazing tool. So I, I get excited by yeah. all the new technology because I get to use the toys. I happen to have stumbled on a Ronald Reagan little clip yesterday. I didn't mm -hmm. appreciate him at all growing up. I wasn't into it or anything. Right. I'm listening to uh, Ronald Reagan, the former president, former actor, if anybody doesn't know <laughs> who he is. And a young person says, you can't communicate with the, the young generation along the idea so what you're saying there's all this new technology and stuff like that so he said he was very blessed that a great idea came to him and you know how he responded to the the guy yeah. who was trying to like outdate him and say you know you're obsolete old man you know what he said he goes yeah. we invented all that technology 
our generation, we built that. We invented it all. So um, that's great. You, you know, we're very blessed. I am. I think you're in a similar age group mm. that we learned how to do it manual. We learned how to do it automatically. Yeah. And there's absolutely nothing to be afraid of. It's all to be embraced. It's exciting to live in these times. All these things. I'm still as excited about our field as I was the day I started and got up at four o'clock in the morning to catch that 417 train to get into the city for my 5:30 a.m. shift. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I I uh, I agree with you a hundred percent. I mean, I I am not a good writer. Never have been a good writer. Never been my strength. <laughs> um, I, the thing is, I know what I want to say in my head, but articulating it is not my strength in that way of in written words. So uh, what this tool does is help me articulate what I'm thinking and put it in words that uh, most of the human population can understand. Um, but yeah, I don't, it has not uh, replaced writers, copywriters at all. Um, if anything, it is a great tool to help speed the process up, create better frameworks. And you still, and a person still needs to go in. They got to edit it. They got to uh, make it their tone, their voice. Like there's still things that have to go into it. You can't just like plug it in and then copy and paste it and stick it up there and be like, hey, it's done. It's no, that's not the way to use that tool. Um, it is a tool and it's in the toolbox and should be used as such. So uh, I, we'll see where it goes from here though, right? So how many other tools in the toolbox are going to be generated in the next uh next year <laughs> you know it'll be funny going back and listening to this episode a year from now and <laughs> see where we're at uh, all right so one last question i wanted to kind of leave you with and I, and I think you you actually touched on it in just our last discussion here but you know and i i feel like it's a cliche question to ask but i but i still you know it's things like this for me i always find it in other places but you know how do you stay how do you stay motivated and inspired you know I think a lot of times as creatives, our, our well runs dry sometimes, right? And and you know, or it's like I don't know, I don't know if you, that happens to you if the dry if the well uh, dry uh, dries up, or you know, if you just feel like you always have boundless ideas. I don't know, but like, where do you find it? Where do you find that continued, uh, you know, the the motivation and the inspiration? Well, I think the basics are still the most important thing. Uh, you know, I'm not usually working for Nike or Apple that needs the most creative cutting edge thing. And if I was, you know, you look around, everything's been done. You get inspired by watching everything. That's for sure. But you can't underestimate the fundamentals. You know, if you could get the fundamentals right, if you could communicate with your clients in a patient way and understand and tolerant and listen. And then if you could communicate with your team in a tolerant way with your artists, because you know, this was just happening to me today. And I have to go through this idea that the way God created everybody's face different, he created everybody's mind different. So there's a million ideas. There's a million ways of doing things. So the secret to good communication for me is good communication with the client, good patient communication with the team. So as much as you're asking, how do you stay on the cutting edge? Just getting the fundamentals right. If you could, in my personal opinion, if you could get the fundamentals right, if you could stay on budget, if you do it on time, if you could communicate well with the clients and so forth and be in the right genre, you know, calmness brings success and brings good projects. There's some basic fundamentals that need to be taken care of. And when you hear something, like I said before, that touches you, it's going to touch other people, a story that comes from the heart, touches the heart. This is about communicating with people. As long as you keep it on the human emotional level, you're going to communicate with people. So when you ask about the most creative, the most cutting edge, I still think the fundamental communications is like the main thing, both in the final product and with everybody involved in producing the product. I love it. You said it all. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, David Jassy from DMJ Studios, thank you so much for coming on today. Where can people get a hold of you? DMJstudios.net is our web address. And our phone number is really easy. I don't know if people still use a phone. 516-300-1500. I bought that number years ago. And we do still get some calls. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. People still use the phone. <laughs> people still use the phone. Yeah. 
Awesome. Well, thanks again for coming on today. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you, you spending time with us today. Thank you, Chris. It was really a pleasure being on your show. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who is watching and listening to this right now. I appreciate each and every one of you for taking the time to listen to us and uh, have this great conversation. So if you'd like to connect, please use the links in the show notes below. Uh, and those will take you to all the places. And if you'd like to get connected to David, uh, those links are there as well. And once again, thank you all so much for watching and listening. And please hit that follow or subscribe button wherever you're watching or listening to this. Uh, the Rocket Live podcast is available anywhere you get podcasts. And of course, you can watch the video versions over on YouTube. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. See you next time.